Hello, and welcome to Credibly Challenged, a podcast on bank risk management. My name is Matt Bizantz, and I'm a bank regulatory partner with the law firm of Mayor Brown. I'm joined by Isaac Boltanski, a director of public policy at BTIG, the consulting firm. Um, Isaac has put out a number of great papers on bank capital in the recent months and also on other banking issues. And so I thought he would be a good person to come and give a perspective on, on what he is seeing in the broader bank risk management market as it relates to financial risk and also some of the political risk that we've seen in D.C. in recent months. Isaac, thanks for being on our program. Thanks for the invite. So we're in 2024 already a, a little bit. Um, but we still can make predictions because um, people will be listening to this down the road. And so hopefully they will look back and say, oh, that was a brilliant prediction they made for 2024. But what, what's one key thing that, that you've been um, looking for where you think maybe the market hasn't caught on to your idea for what's going to happen? Yeah, look, I think I think from the macro political perspective, the way to think about it is it's going to be a dumpster fire on top of a train wreck. And so I think that we need to be emotionally prepared for what is going to be the longest general election in history. And it's going to put our semi-structurally challenged gerontocracy into full view. And I think that that's going to be deeply concerning for markets. And I think we can roll through all the different scenarios, and we should. But at least at the moment, it is Trump v. Biden again. And that's going to be a very, very, very close election. Matt, we got to keep in mind, this election was decided last time around by 40,000 folks in three states. So this is going to be close. And the implications are huge geopolitically, but also in in bank regulatory land, as as I know you and I will discuss. So I think the the one thing that my clients still haven't gotten their arms around because they don't want to yet Mm -hmm. is that this election is going to be long, messy. And anyone who tells you they've got a feel for what's going on is lying. It's this is going to be a topsy turvy, messy few months. Yeah, that, that's a great perspective. And and as a, a fellow DC resident like you are, um, I have I have two thoughts. First, I'm a registered independent, so um, I I sometimes find all of the political interworkings of of DC to be tiresome and boring compared to the cool financial products I get to work on. But the other one is um, even in law firms that there's no official retirement age. That's that's typically not allowed under various um, age laws. But, you know, when someone hits 60, 65, it's, it's like, hey, you know, maybe cut back. Um, even in banks, I think that you see very few bank CEOs over the age of 65 or 70 at the largest banks. And and so the idea that, um, that both um, candidates, as you pointed out, both current expected candidates are are well north of those thresholds. That that is an odd thing for someone who is a millennial in a somewhat younger generation to be like, hey, what what when is it our turn? So um, and just to be clear, it's not it's not just age. Right. Right? It's not just age. It's mental acuity, it's capacity. And if we look at this is I think a perfect microcosm for for the messiness of the next few months. You know, President Biden had a rough Thursday of last week. And that Thursday entailed the her report from the special counsel, which described him as a confused elderly man. And then he had a terrible press conference and it was awful. It looked like everything was going against Biden. And then Trump comes out and says what he said about NATO Mm -hmm. and takes that defeat right out of the jaws of victory or however Mm -hmm. you want to say it. And and my, my thinking with that is just we're going to have that type of back and forth for the next few months where no one feels good. No one feels enthused about where we are. But that's also going to put a lot more uh, emphasis on what's going to be done during this year while we mm-hmm. still know it's a Biden administration. And it's going to put a lot of, of import into who wins the Senate and the House. And one thing, um, as a, a former federal employee myself, one of the things that I am thrilled about that we have in, in this country is that um, we have an apolitical um, federal workforce that are not allowed to campaign for either side. And like in the federal uh, um, uh, buildings, they aren't allowed to have signs up and that kind of thing. And so while, of course, they they can vote and, and have their freedom of expression outside of their jobs, that when they're on the job, they are supposed to be apolitical civil servants. And we've got a ton of those 
sitting down the street from us here in the Federal Reserve, in the OCC, across the river in the FDIC. Um, what do you think those policymakers will be doing over over this year before the election? Well, I think that there's still going to be an, an acute awareness of the political calendar. And for me, that's most important when we think about something called the Congressional Review Act, which I know you have written about a lot, and I think I've cribbed from some of your writings before. So I, I will let you um, detail that as you see fit. But effectively, there is a there is a risk that if you don't have your rules finalized by, depending upon the calendar, let's just say May of this year because of the nuances of the CRA, um, then it could get reversed by Republicans if they win the White House in both chambers of Congress. I tend to think that this is not as big of a risk for financial services rules solely because our issues usually um, don't get the CRA treatment. You see that time spent on other agencies' work like um, environmental regs and the such. But perhaps this time is different. And so I think what you're going to have is a mad sprint to get as many of these rules finalized before that drop dead date, which depends on how many days Congress is in session. So it's a little bit murky, but there's going to be a mad rush to get that done. And I think that's what we're going to see over the next couple months here, Matt, is just a ton of paper flying around, right? And, and I think that it's going to be driven in large part by that as yet undetermined deadline. Yeah, I, I think one thing markets and at least my clients at financial institutions hate above all is uncertainty. That if you look back to when I was a kid in the 80s, we had inflation far above where it is now, and that was considered a success compared to the 70s. Um, and we had one of the best economies in, in my lifetime in that period in the 80s. And it was because people were certain of one thing, that inflation was going to be at a moderate to high level. Um, and in, in today's climate, there is far less certainty about bank policy, as, as you alluded to with the Congressional Review Act, that, that even something like which rules could be subject to it are driven by the arcane day counting of, of the congressional calendar. And so if, um, if a regulator finalizes something on May 9th and it doesn't get published in the Federal Register until May 20th, and that 60-day period begins on May 16th, well, then maybe the rule is susceptible to challenge, whereas if the rule gets published on the 15th, it's not. And that's um, not, not only is that kind of uncertain, but that's also almost an arbitrary way to make policy on the calendar. Um, I, I recall at the um, beginning of the Biden administration when the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency had finalized its fair access rule about when banks would have to provide deposit services to um, people, both corporations and individuals. And I recall it being finalized that first week of January. Um, and it was put on the OCC's website. It was saying, this is a new regulation. It will take effect on this date later in the year. And, and you know, I started writing an alert like so that you could crib from it for, for your alerts. Um, and, and then there was the inauguration on the 20th, and on the 21st, the OCC came out and said, oh, we're not actually going to send it over to the Federal Register. It never happened. Um, and, and that, to me, is, again, a wild way to make policy. Uh, if it had just gotten printed in the, 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 nine, the, the January 19th edition of the Federal Register, it would be a regulation that would apply to 40 of the largest national banks. But because it wasn't typeset before the 20th, it's not a regulation anymore. So, yeah, that kind of uncertainty, I think, drives bankers crazy. Um, and I think I think when we think about the CRA as well, and you're, you're right, I mean, the way that we do some things in terms of getting uh, the typeface over the government printing office for it to get into the Federal Register, I mean, it is arcane, but, you know, there's a quaintness to it as well. Mm -hmm. Um, but with that being said, I, I would just highlight something that at least from the bank investor side that I think has been an interesting area and I want to be interested in your thoughts on is there's a belief that um, the CRA can be used to undo anything and be done, can be used quickly and without pain. And I just I've seen repeatedly that um, Senate now minority leader McConnell, and in, in this scenario, he would be majority leader. He's never prioritized financial services issues. It's other, always others. And in part because 
they're going to put in new heads of the agencies, as you know. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. a lot of the financial services issues of, of import and of consequence can be softened in a Republican sweep scenario rather than reversed. And and the other part of that that I, I would like mm-hmm. you to put your lawyer hat on for me is the the fact that you effectively salt the earth for future regulation. Mm-hmm. That's something that um, my clients, I think, are always interested in. Yeah, and I think that for what, when you look at areas like capital regulation, that's a, a, a big concern. That if you go at it with the CRA and you you take down something like Basel Endgame with the CRA, you are in according to some experts saying that the regulators may no longer change the capital rules. And I don't know that that would be a good outcome until until Congress takes further action. That maybe under the major policy doctrine. The, the courts would say that's a good thing, but but I don't know that most bankers would want the capital ro- rules frozen until Congress gets around to it. Um, and, and that's in part because Congress, for all the little that they produce, is actually fairly busy. And when we look at it, when there's something truly important, like when COVID hits, when there was 9-11, um, they can and do act in big ways that we we have the Patriot Act. Um, We had TARP in the 2008 financial crisis. But when it's something that is less than that, it doesn't really matter how important it is to any constituency. Um, It still will be of relative importance to Congress that we've seen presidents demand that Congress take action on things and and Congress doesn't care. Um, So to assume that Congress will be interested in spending its little uh, limited uh, debate time and floor time on Congressional Review Act um, items on various bank regulations, particularly if they're regulations that, like you said, can be softened through supervisory policy. Um, I I agree with you, I'm a bit skeptical of it. One thing I did wanna ask you about supervisory policy though, because it's something I've been hearing more and more about in recent months, um, is this notion that the um, lower level people who are implementing policy, like the bank examiners, the the lower level lawyers in the agencies, that they um, will feel swayed uh, by the over by the changing political climates. And I think there have been some who have said, well, look, after S2155 passed, it didn't say anything about supervision, but I felt like I couldn't give banks lower ratings. Um, and, and to me, that's Again, as a lawyer, that's a, a bit of a weird concept because I'm, I'm used to telling clients, here's what the law says, here's how you can apply it to your situation, um, not not like, well, this person's in charge now, so so this set of rules will apply. But when you're looking at that kind of policy influence, what what are your clients seeing? Yeah, look, I, I, let's let's go back in history for a second. Like, I, I'm old enough to remember when S2155 passed and when Quarles took over as as the the Federal Reserve Vice Chair for Supervision, there were some who thought that those two things in hand would bring in a hellscape for financial services. We were going to tear down all regulations. When you go back to it, I'll tell you, the folks who were least happy tended to be the bankers, tended to be the bank lobbyists. They expected much more change. I would argue S2155 and the and the bar regime were relatively modest in in the changes that they made. Yeah, they tweaked the Volcker rule, but the Volcker rule is still here, for example. Right? Yes, we had tailoring, but that didn't mean we have a removal. And I find the whole notion that 2155 and bar caused the banking crisis in March of last year to be just ludicrous. Like mm-hmm. I have seen absolutely no connection whatsoever. Those are failures of the market. They are failures of the supervisory regime. They are, they are failures that we have now done autopsies on from numerous agencies. Those are not the cause of a sweeping change from on high. Those we can point to a number of different problems. Right. Um, I, I, to me, I, I look at this as um, instead any, any hardening that we have at the supervisory level, I think is due to the failure that we saw from supervisors in in the run up to the banking crisis in March of 2023. So I don't think of it as a policy mm-hmm. driven change or anything like that. I think it's just that we're seeing tighter regulatory um, uh, strictures and and controls 
due to what happened last March. And, and I can tell you, some of my banks and, and bank investors I talk to say that their supervisors are treating them now, um, they're acting, excuse me, like like equity analysts calling mm-hmm. and saying, hey, why is your stock down a point and a half? Yeah. And and I get that. I get the heightened alert because of what we saw in March of last year. But I think it's because of that, not because of any um, top level political shift or, or the possibility of one. Yeah, I think there was a recent speech about how maybe we shouldn't um, reassign all of our bank examiners to um, search social media for commentary about banks, that maybe that's not the most efficient thing. And um, I was teaching at, uh, a, a guest lecture at uh, George Mason Law School a couple of weeks ago. And, and one of the things I brought up is that all of capital regulation is based on accounting. And so that, that sets the capital based on the accounts on a bank's balance sheet. And it has no relation to a bank's current stock price. That those accounts are set based on the bank's profits and the price it originally sold the stock at. But the stock could go down to zero and the bank would still have a capital account. Um, and and that, there is that disconnect, I think, among examiners. Um, another area of uncertainty that I think maybe your your bank perspective or your 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 group of banks would have is um, around who to bank. That you have things like the Safe Banking Act for cannabis banking. You have um, things like the recent news around um, the regulators pressuring um, banks to terminate their fintech partnerships. You have the still long running things of how if you're an MSB you cannot get a bank account basically. Um, and, and I, I find this interesting because, um, from a risk perspective, like the FinCEN says there's something like several hundred banks that are banking cannabis companies to one degree or another that I live in DC. I can walk down the street and I see the dispensaries. Um, and yet terrible things have not happened to the financial system because some banks are quietly banking cannabis. Um, on the other hand, we've, we've seen what happens with Russia um, and, and with other places where money for terrorism is getting through and is doing bad things. And while we may focus on them, it's certainly um, nowhere near the focus we give to, you know, talking about when the Safe Banking Act will pass or what to do with fintech banking. And, and how, how do your banks see kind of that that misallocation of risk risk focus from the the supervisors yeah so so let me start on cannabis and then and then step back and and just so your folks know you know we're an investment bank so my clients are hedge funds and mutual funds and and corporates that are banking clients and and i've been close to the cannabis story for a while here and partly that's just because i like the puns matt you know i can Mm -hmm. say i can say there's budding optimism about a Mm -hmm. cannabis bill but it was blunted by senator crapo like, oh, that's fun for me. Right. But it, 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 more importantly, I think that the the Safe Banking Act, which is a bill that would make it, um, which would uh, provide a safe harbor for banks to to provide access to banking services to cannabis operators. I, I think that bill is is indicative of a broader problem we have with federalism here, because the states have moved on cannabis. Cannabis is here. Mm-hmm. We can, as you said, just step outside and breathe in deep. It's here. Mm -hmm. And so I I look at safe banking and I have actually thought that this bill should become law, even though it's not a good bill. I don't like it. I think there are problems with its structure, but I think it's necessary because these are cash heavy businesses. These are businesses that usually primarily accept cash, which means that they are a target for criminals. And we have seen crime around it accordingly. People have died because of this incongruity between state and federal law. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I have become right. a, a, someone who thinks that we need something like the Safe Banking Act, even though it's not perfect. The most national banks still probably wouldn't even bank yep. it. It would just make it easier for credit unions. To meet. So that one I want to put to the side. Mm-hmm. The other one to me is is a broader conversation that I, I think we're just starting to have in terms of in terms of of access to financial services. And I am afraid that we are moving into a landscape where we're going to have red banks and blue banks, or we're going to have red payment companies and blue payment companies. We're going to have red investment advisors mm-hmm. and blue investment advisors. And that's good for absolutely no one. 
Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that I think that there is a realization here that this becomes a tit for tat with escalation from each side where everyone ends up losing. I hope there's that realization and we stop it. I thought that we were there after Operation Choke Point, but I was wrong. Mm -hmm. um, it's only gotten worse and more convoluted. Part of that is because federalism is tricky. Um, but part of that is also just because whenever our issues enter the political sphere, they become messier by a hundred mm -hmm. times. And so I, I do want to put cannabis onto its own path because that one I think is, is indicative and I think representative and I think a good place for us to discuss how to solve the problem when you have incongruities between state and federal law with the wrapper of politics. Right. Makes sense. Um, speaking of, of where po uh, politics have made something messy, even messier, uh, crypto. I've never bought crypto. Um, I have clients who are engaged in it to varying degrees. I'm guessing you have clients who are either engaged in it or have opinions on it and maybe you've even bought it yourself. Um, have you rushed into the new ETFs that were authorized by the SEC? Oh no, no. Um, I don't I don't I don't buy securities. That's too much that's too much risk for my compliance department. I keep it I keep it bland, Matt. What are your thoughts, though, on the way that that ETF discussion chugged through that we've had for 80, 90 years, this idea that the federal government is not a merits regulator of securities, that as long as there is a full and fair disclosure of the facts and the risks to the investor, the investor is free to make all the stupid investments they want, um, unless it's crypto. What, what are your thoughts on, on that way we're assessing risk? Yeah, I mean, so let's do the ETF first. I mean, the 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 original sin here was that the SEC approved the Bitcoin futures ETF, at which point it was impossible for them uh, to continue their objection to the Bitcoin spot ETFs. They did, and then they got shut down by the courts, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that one that one was uh, had a lot to do with SEC Chairman Gensler's disdain for crypto, disdain for the community. Um, there are lots of issues with that one. But I would also say, like, step back. We've spent four years in town trying to get smart about digital currency and how it interplays with our Frankenstein's monster of a regulatory system. And I do think that we've wasted a lot of time where that could have been spent on other issues. You know, we're not talking about the chartering issue, which is still so important to me. We're not talking about the ILCs that are on hold. We're not talking about bank partners or fintechs getting hit with MRAs and other um, supervisory pushback um, at a much higher clip. We're not talking about the future of banking. We spent all this time talking about crypto. Mm -hmm. Right. Which I still yeah. haven't seen have a true market function. Mm -hmm. Distributed ledger technology. Sure. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Smart contracts. Mm -hmm. That sounds as cool as anything I've heard of in a long time in right. terms of its applicability to the future of finance and 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 uh, you know real estate law in particular stands out to me there. But I, I feel as though it's just taken a lot of our bandwidth mm -hmm. and wasted it when we should have been focusing on other things. And I, I, I think that that to me is the biggest tragedy out of all of this is, you know, we had lawmakers who were jumping at the opportunity to take a picture with Sam Bankman Freed. And mm -hmm. now they spent the past year and a half scrubbing their social me media profiles of those mm -hmm. same photos. And it's just a lot of wasted time not talking about our existing financial infrastructure and regulatory architecture. So to that point of the existing financial structure that I started law school in 2009, and before that, the federal regulators were approving over 50 new banks a year. That if you go back into the 90s, it was well more than that, but um, they were approving 50 or so new banks a year at least. And since then, that approval rate has dropped to the low single digits. Uh, and I know you can blame me for becoming a lawyer, but but I, I, I'd say that's correlation, not causation. Um, however, I was out in Utah a couple weeks ago with the Stena Centers at the University of Utah, their annual fintech conference. Great conference if you're trying to schedule something. Um, but also, um, I was shocked to hear how many people were saying, look, we want an ILC. 
were willing to be regulated by the FDIC. We had the one of the governor's aides, the governor came and spoke at the conference, and we had one of the governor's aides saying, yes, our, our banking regulator is more than happy to review and approve um, worthy candidates. We know they can't get FDIC insurance. Doesn't matter how safe their business model is, um, just on a, on a pure intransigence basis, the FDIC will not move forward with deposit insurance applications. Uh, and that that is get that gets news in my circle. It probably gets news in your circle. But you're right. It doesn't get news in the circle of of even the commentators who are talking about the Bitcoin ETFs. Um, what do you think it'll take before we get some movement on things like, you know, get bringing in the non banks to the bank regulatory perimeter? I don't have a good answer, Matt. I don't. I think I think. First off, it's 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 not particularly sexy, right? When we're talking about the wall between banking and commerce, it's not something that I think is going to get a bunch of clicks on CNBC or Bloomberg. So I think that's always going to be a headwind for it. I find it intriguing, though, because we have now forced the innovation to go through bank partnership channels. And then we're also saying the bank partnerships <laughs> aren't what we want. And it's just it's it's tough for me. Because I, I think that when I think about Walmart, for example, going for its ILC, I still get the question, do you think Walmart's going to come back? Do you think they're going to try for an ILC? My goodness, have you not paid attention? They don't need it. They don't need it. They found a much better way to do it. And so it's once again, I, I feel like in D.C. we are often, and this is true in, in bank regulation, and it's sure as heck true in mortgage regulation, fighting the wars of 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And and so, look, my, my answer to you is I don't think it ever will. I think that perhaps the next round of ILC applicants, when we talk about um, having more of a nexus with the, the American consumer, perhaps <laughs> we can mm -hmm. see uh, a little bit more coverage. But no, it's, it's too nerdy. It's too in the weeds. It's not going to get as much attention as crypto did. When you're talking to your clients who, like you said, they're they're the, the big private money sources who are very responsible and probably wouldn't dabble in crypto even if it was a good deal for them, what do they see as the areas for opportunity over the next year or so? That we, we've talked about all the things that could go wrong with the election and 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 with obstinate regulators, but like it, is there is there opportunity in loan origination? Is there opportunity in, in M&A? Where, where do you see like the the deals or the sectors that are most interesting in financial services. Sure. So look, if a Republican wins, I think that we're going to see a wave of M&A. Um, the the Republican uh, White House scenario is not just a deregulatory one; it's also an M&A one. So that one has been an area of of distinct focus over the past few weeks. You know, when we talk about moving. A lot of the regulatory requirements uh, for being a bank over 250 billion down to those banks who are just over 100 billion. You can see that there's a cohort of banks that may be interested in M&A. We're now making the 100 billion threshold a whole lot like the 10 billion used to, where you don't want to walk over, you want to jump over. So that that's one area. I would also say, and this is why I read your work and 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 you know I like all of your LinkedIn posts to see where you're speaking, is CRT. I mean, look, bank CRT is hands down the number one area of client interest among financial services investors right now. What's it going to look like? Who's going to be the leader in the clubhouse? Who are the buyers going to be? Um, you know, and within that, there are also ideas of, you know, who could be non-bank, other non-bank targets for um, for feeding the the credit businesses of these large guys, right? Or there's some non-bank consumer lenders or small business lenders that might just get gobbled up so that they can feed the the machine on that end. So really, it's it's about um, it's about CRT, it's about consolidation. Those are the topics that I've gotten most over the past few weeks. Great, Isaac. We'll have to check in in a year and see how those predictions have shaken out. I, I really want to thank you for, for joining us today. Incredibly challenged and, and getting that wisdom on the, the good and the bad that might happen over the next year. I also want to thank our listeners. Without you, we wouldn't have a reason to do these programs. Um, please tune in for the next 
edition of Credibly Challenged. Have a great day.